All right, so back, we're talking FF7, we're talking Rebirth, we're here to look at some more translations regarding the game, of course. Um, I don't know that there's any from Audrey that we're going to look at. There was a few that we've yet to touch on every time we've done a video, uh, but she also hasn't put anything new in the last couple days and that I think is worth talking about anyways. She's also been playing the Final Fantasy 16 DLC. Uh, we got definitely a handful from Shin Arc that we're going to look at, but first I want to talk about the cells of Rebirth, which is something people ask me to talk about quite often here recently. I keep forgetting to talk about it in videos. I want to put it at the beginning of the videos, but I hop into making my videos and I get like halfway through or get finished with the video. I'm like, fuck, I forgot to talk about the cells again. I don't want to put it at the end. To be honest, there's not really a whole lot I can add to the conversation that we haven't already talked about, right? I did a video some time ago where we talked about like the physical cells were pretty low in Japan. Or, like the second week, they dropped like 90% in the second week or something, the physical cells. We don't know the digital cells overall. And we don't know the overall cells numbers, period, when it comes to Rebirth. Square Enix hasn't touted that shit like they did with Remake, right? With Remake, they were more than happy to talk about the game selling like three and a half million in the first three days or whatever it was, right? Like they were excited to talk about that. And they're not doing that with Rebirth. Rebirth is... I mean, we're pushing close to two months now that the game's been out, and they've yet to be like, hey, here's how many fucking copies we sold, right? So there's got to be some sort of underperforming somewhere. Otherwise, they'd be talking about it, they'd be bragging about it. So tweets are a bit older, but they say, for the UK charts, digital plus physical GSD data last week, Helldivers 2, number one for a fourth consecutive week, although sales are finally dropping, but still only down by 30% week on week. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is number two, while the remake and Rebirth double packs is at number four. Overall, both combined, Rebirth sales are down 34% over the remake launch, which released on a bigger platform and during the first COVID lockdown, sales are up 6% over the Final Fantasy 16 launch. At least in the UK, Rebirth is underperforming compared to Remake. That's not really a surprise. We've talked a lot about the two games and why one's going to do better than the other. But it's actually doing a little bit better than the launch of 16, which is kind of interesting because I think from all the metrics that we have, like generally it seemed like 16 had a more successful launch, but at least in the UK, it seems like Rebirth is doing better. We also have Daniel Mod here, I think, is talking about just kind of the overall sales of Rebirth, but he says, also not to be that guy, but Rebirth is underperforming sales-wise, and then he followed up, replied to another tweet and said, it's not about half of what Remake sold in the same time frame, and looks like it'll have a weaker tail prior to any PlayStation Plus-like release. According to him, Rebirth is doing about half of what Remake was doing in the same time frame, and those tweets were a handful of days ago, so might as well say about a month and a half from release of Rebirth, so about the first month and a half of Remake, whatever those sales numbers were, Rebirth's about half. As he said, it's probably going to have a weaker tell unless they do some sort of PlayStation Plus thing, which they did with Remake, I think, like, about a year, maybe a little less than a year from the launch of Remake. They ended up putting it on PlayStation Plus where you could get it for free or whatever. It's kind of cool. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if, if Rebirth is underperforming from the launch and then, like, the week-to-week, month-to-month sells or whatever, it's doing less than what Remake did, then, of course, it's going to, like, overall underperform, I would think. That's not really a surprise. Like I said, though, previously, there's not a whole lot I can add to this, right? We've kind of touched on everything that's in this conversation with the previous video we did on this, right? I know people want me to talk about it, and that's fine. I don't mind talking about it. I'm just going to be saying the same stuff I said before, right? There's people that just don't like the remake project in general because it's not a one-to-one -one remake, right? They don't like that it's broken up into multiple parts, episodes, whatever terms they want to use. We know they're full games, but you know, from the outside perspective, they just don't like that. They like the new combat. They don't like the new voice actors. They don't like the possibility of new shit. Whether there is or isn't new shit doesn't matter. See, so you also have them getting people in on the ground of the remake project on the PS4 and then moving directly to the PS5. And now I'm... I was of that mindset. I'm definitely still there a bit because I, I do think it's kind of fucked up they did that, right? You get all the people playing the remake project on the PS4 and you instantly have to like turn around a year later and buy the PS5 to play the enhanced version and the UV DLC. I was mad about that. I still am kind of mad about that. But it is better for the remake project itself to move on to the PS5 because it's a better platform, obviously. Something that IGN actually pointed out that I think is a little interesting is that you have the price increase, obviously. If you played remake... If this is 60 bucks to buy, and then you want to play Rebirth at $70. Some people have a big problem with that. And the name itself, too, is something I never even really thought of, but it's called, you know, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. It's pretty easy to, like, look at Final Fantasy VII Remake and kind of know what you're getting. And when you look at something called Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, unless you're, like, really in the know, like, you don't know exactly what that is, right? To the average consumer, obviously, anybody who's kind of playing the Remake project or, you know, keeps up with this shit, they know what it all is. But regardless, again, this is all just shit we've talked about before. Like, it's not a surprise to me that... Rebirth is doing worse than Remake. I mean, Remake wasn't like, wasn't like crazy, crazy successful. We talked about this a lot over the last couple of years, and we you know got the update last year, September 2023, that Remake had only sold like 7 million copies. And that's never a bad thing. A game seven, selling 7 million copies is not a bad thing, but it took them like, you know, three and a half years to reach that goal. So I'm assuming Rebirth would do worse. It's not really a surprise. Anyways, let's hop into some translations. FF7 Rebirth level designer Yuri Hiroki says the team was reminded to exercise impartiality when it came to who gets selected for the Gold Saucer date. No matter which companion you go on a date with, you can be sure the developers put a lot of thought and effort in. And from everything I've seen, this is definitely true. On my first playthrough, I got Barrett. I was shooting for the Tifa date, but I think I did like one or two side quests before going to the Gold Saucer to do the date scene, and 
it made Barrett my number one, I guess, choice. But I was actually glad I got that because it got me more of Barrett and his wife, him talking about Myrna and stuff like that, which I obviously, that's something I've wanted for fucking ever when it comes to FF7 in general, it's just more of Barrett's backstory. So I was actually really glad I got the Barrett date scene, but I've heard of other ones. I've seen the Tifa one as well. I think I've seen the Aerith one, but I've heard people talk about the Yuffie one, i heard people talk about the Red 13 one. And it seems like no matter what you get, it's a fantastic choice. Actually, by the way, just because we can talk about it now because we're in like the spoiler territory here lately, uh, we talked about like a leak a while back on the channel before... Rebirth actually came out, and I was being very vague about it. Didn't want to like give any hints towards what it might be, but it was about like the Tifa and Cloud date scene because we see them kiss, right? And there's a screenshot going around at the time of them kissing uh, in the gondola or whatever, and people were in the comments like, "Oh, if you're talking about that Tifa Cloud kiss, that's like fake." And it's like, is it though, dumbass? So <laughs> was it fake? Couldn't be more obvious at the time to me and a lot of people that it was clearly a real screenshot, but was, some people were in denial because of the shipping bullshit, I guess. FF7 Rebirth scenario writer Nojima wrote the scenario hoping to give Roche a proper death, but this time, even after he turns into a black robe and seems like a goner, he manages to get on a helicopter and escape the Temple of the Ancients at the last minute. It's also something I'm glad we could talk about now since we're in spoiler territory. Is the Roche story in this game? Absolutely loved it. I love seeing the character again. I think he's a fun character. But man, when you think that like you're going to see him again later in the game, and you do, but man, when he's like starting to degrade and like turn into one of the black robes, like that shit. A little, little emotional, man. I can't say like I was like tearing up or anything, but like that shocked me a bit. And I hate to see my guy like that. But it's cool that he survived, so we might see him, or probably will see him at some point in the third game. What that'll be exactly, I don't know. Maybe another boss fight. Maybe it's just a black robe that's in the background type shit or something. I don't know. But like, I was actually surprised that they got like a serious moment out of like such a th like over the top character. Absolutely loved it. FF7 Rebirth co-director Moto Motoriyama says his number one favorite line in the game comes from a Bex badass side quest at the very end of which Cloud says, Psych. He thinks Nojima adding that one line put a neat bow on an episode that otherwise lacks punch. So we talking about there is at the end of the quest, Cloud says the word Psych, which is a callback to Jesse, of course, from Remake, who says it, I think, a couple times. <laughs> Welcome home, honey. Took your sweet time. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Psych. I might be falling after all. Psych. Nighty night. Psych. To be honest, I don't know how much better it made the quest because, like, I definitely recognize the callback, but I, it's not like that like made the quest overall better for me or anything like that. So I actually just did this quest like last night, I think, because uh, I haven't played Rebirth in a few days, and I was hopping on to just kind of wrap up some more random side quests and just kind of do everything that I haven't done yet. I'm trying to do everything I can besides the platinum, because I'm probably not going to get the platinum for the game. But I still want to, you know, knock out everything I can. I actually just did this quest, which was, I'll be honest, a little underwhelming. I actually like the Bex badasses stuff throughout the game for the most part. And I like that we kind of convert them to good guys inevitably. Um, but then right there, at the, that last quest right there that you do in Chapter 12, they just go back to being bad guys by the end of it. And it's like, eh. It's like the easiest thing to do. Like, the subverting of expectations would have been them staying, or tra at least trying to stay good guys, at least for this game. I'm fine if they want to be, like, bad guys again in the third game, maybe. Maybe they want to give up on the good guy shit by then. But, like, for them to be bad guys, and then we kind of make them good guys, and they're bad guys again by the end, it's just, like, the obvious thing to do. I, think I was kind of interested in what the guys would do if they are good. Torama says they wanted to subvert expectations by starting the game with Zack, since fans of the original would predict it would begin in Calm. Also, from the beginning, Nojima had written that the opening should establish that Cloud's world is separate from Zack's. This is something I absolutely loved. I love the opening of the game because we didn't know how the game was going to begin. We knew the demo, obviously picked up in the calm flashback and you behind incident and all that shit. But how what was the very beginning of the game going to be? Were they going to give us a continuation from the ending of Remake? Or were they start with the demo and then we get into like the ending of Remake shit? We didn't know. And getting to like start the game and control Zack and actually get to use Zack and shit was pretty fucking cool. And he's definitely right about the subverting of the expectations because for the longest time people theorized that it was going to pick up directly like in media res, right, right in the middle of Cloud telling the story. Us in the back of the truck, Sephiroth, Cloud, all that shit, right? So everybody thought for the longest time, and that is technically still true, because we do pick up, you know, with the flashback right, right after that, but still, like, it's not the very beginning of the game. And, like, but also, I like that Nojima you know, wanted to establish from the very beginning that Cloud and Zack's worlds were different, right? It was something we were saying for the longest time, dude. Whenever we got the first, like, real trailer that showed us, like, the dead bodies or whatever, or the dead bodies of the characters, and... People had so many, like, it's always conspiracy theories and weird shit in this community. It's Genova, it's Sephiroth, it's it's Shinra trying to, their body doubles, they're trying to cover up their death or pretend like they caught them or whatever. And it's like, no, it's just different worlds, what we thought all along. It's just a matter of now that we've actually played Rebirth, the context of what those worlds are. And I actually called, I think almost exactly, a, long, a while back, about what would be happening with Rebirth, is that Zack would stumble into Sector 5, 
the giant TV. He would see their bodies and go and save Aerith. And that's like, I literally called that shit. It's like the first thing that happens in the game. I just got to talk my shit a little bit here because we explained like a long time ago, like why the Shinra cover up stuff never made sense. And there's people that are all the time talking about what they think is going on with the game. And I don't pretend to know everything, but like they were dead set on the Shinra cover up stuff. And we broke down every reason why that never made any sense. And of course it never made sense. And of course I was right on that. It's probably the juiciest piece of info from the whole video, which you always got to save for last. Toriyama thinks the ultimate structure of the world will become clear in the third game. Nojima says you can think of the different versions of Stamp as many worlds existing. However, he says it's a little bit different from the concept of so-called parallel worlds. So by Nojima saying that these aren't comparable to like parallel worlds, as in like multiple dimensions, multiple universes, realities, it might get rid of the idea of the multiverse shit. And this is something I've been talking about a little more recently when we talk about this shit in videos is... What are these worlds? Are they actual, like, real worlds that have existed again for millions of years type shit? Are they recently created? Are they actual, real, tangible worlds? And since he says they're not parallel worlds necessarily, I kind of write that off. And something I've been saying for a while. That are these, like, just kind of like realities, maybe, that exist within the planet? And since they're inside the planet, they're part of the live stream. They're not technically real, if that makes any sense. Something I've been saying for a bit, right? Because people, you know, they see Aerith alive in one of these other worlds and it's like well Aerith's alive over there in that world and it's like well is she alive are these are any of these worlds alive are they technically real i say that mostly because of what sephiroth says in the game that you know these other worlds are created within the planet and if they're like within the planet you know they're below our character's feet right not even like real like this they're not you know they're not, they don't exist like we do type shit they're part of the live stream and with nojima saying that they're not comparable to parallel worlds kind of i think would write off the multiple realities discussion i would say at least, like, from, like, the idea that, like, we're in Timeline 1 and Zack and them are in Timeline 2. And then over here, this other fucking stamp is Timeline 3. Like, we can probably write that shit off. It's, I don't know that we have full context, obviously, yet for what these other worlds are. But it seems like it at least gets rid of that idea. It's not to say that, like, going back to the air thing, that she can't be alive or come back to life sort of thing. Or that Zack isn't necessarily alive at the end of the game. Because we have seen one thing pulled from one world to the other, right? We've seen Cloud get the white material. So it's maybe possible that even if these other worlds aren't technically real, that you can bring something from them to the actual world, right? And, like, the example I used in a recent video was, like, Nightmare on Elm Street type shit, right? These are, like, dream worlds, essentially. But if you can grab an object, you can bring it with you back to reality. So it is possible that the Zack we see at the end of the game is in the real world. Maybe maybe is, maybe isn't. I don't know. We'll have to wait till the third game to see that. In Eric's case, I think, even though it's maybe possible that that can happen, they're probably going to keep her dead because they do have said, like, multiple times in, like, translations and interviews and shit that, like, if a character dies in Rebirth or whoever dies in Rebirth is going to stay dead. So, like, they're probably not going to, like, bring Aerith back to life. She'll probably be in the third game in the same way she's in Rebirth at the end, even though she's supposed to be dead, right? Like, in Cloud's mind or talking to Cloud from the planet, talking to Cloud from these other worlds, whatever capacity, she'll definitely be in the third game for sure. To go back to my video where I talked about what my thoughts were on the ending, that was right before the Ultimate was coming out. And that was based on what we see in the game, right? And we're shown multiple realities, so I was of the mindset that the multiverse is real. But as we've kind of gone on and got more translations and talked about this more, like I've kind of moved away a bit from that. It's just a matter of not knowing fully what the worlds are, right? And I, with Nojima saying these aren't comparable to parallel worlds, would I uh, think right off the multiverse discussion. Guys, dudes, that'll be the video. Of course, pass out to you guys what your thoughts on what we talked about in this video. I guess specifically the main big one would be that in there, uh, Nojima confirming that these aren't necessarily comparable to parallel worlds. How does that maybe change your thoughts on the end of the game if it does at all? Anyways, that's the video. Subscribe to the channel if you guys are new. So, in the description below. Follow me on Twitter. That's it. That's it. Bye. Used to care what people thought, but now I care more. And nobody out here's got it figured out. So therefore, I've lost all hope of a happy ending. Depending on whether or not it's worth it. So insecure, no one's perfect. We spend it with no shame. We blow that like old train. We in here like Rogaine or leave it like Cobain.